our next speaker is Fu Chou Tang. Uh, he's a professor at Biopic at Beijing University. As all of you may know, he's the very first man to do single cell MRI seq. His lab has developed a series of single cell genomic sequencing technologies that have systematically dissected the epigenetic regulation of gene expression network in human early embryos, as well as germline cells. He's also a poet among the Chinese scientific community. It's welcome. OK. Uh, uh, first, I want to thank Guoji and all the organizers for giving me this uh, excellent chance uh, to present the recent work uh, from my lab. And I know that Guoji really uh, put a tremendous efforts to make this uh, conference really uh, great. So my, my lab mainly uh, interested in the human uh, germline cells. As you know that in our body, basically, uh, there's two uh, large uh, classes, uh, types of cells, the germline cells and the non-germline cells. And the germline cells is that uh, our um, genetic information just uh, uh, goes through the cells and uh, keep uh, immortal. So that means, for example, for our human species, during the past uh, one uh, million years, so the, our genetic information is always just uh, uh, goes through our germline cells uh, permanently. But other cells is only uh, uh, after the, what the individual die, they just disappear. And the next generation, so the non-germline cells is all, always come from these uh, germline cells. But when we are trying to analyze the human uh, germline cells is really difficult and challenging. Uh, not only just because, for example, as a starting point, the gigot, one embryo is only composed of one individual cell, but also uh, because it's hydrogenated. Uh, for example, even for uh, the same human, all these uh, uh, millions of these uh, sperm cells and every cell are genetically different due to the homologous uh, recombination. So we really need to develop some single cell and whole genome uh, scale um, measure to analyze the gene expression network in our germline cells. So 11 years ago, uh, once did to uh, did postdoc uh, in UK, so we developed the first single cell RNA seq uh, technology. So with this technology in hand, just using one cell as from mouse or human, we can analyze all the twenty thousand known genes expression accurately. And then um, I think during the past years, it really the field expand a lot, and uh, now I think thousands of labs are using the single cell uh, RNA seq technology as the main tools to dissect their own biological or medical. Questions, and then uh, ten years ago, I came back, uh, went back to uh, Peking University to set up my own lab. Uh, I want to analyze the epigenetic regulation of gene expression in the human uh, germline cells. So we know that epigenetic, one of the most important layer is the DNA methylation. So at that time, the DNA methylation is also difficult to analyze uh, using. Uh, at that time, I think still need. Uh, millions of cells to do it. So we tried very hard uh, using several years to set up the first single cell DNA methylome sequencing technology. And with this technology, you, from human or mouse, just one individual cell, we can analyze the, at least one million CBG size uh, methylation information. And then we collaborated with the clinicians to analyze our germline, how the epigenetic reprogramming happened. So now we can get a quite clear global uh, pattern of these uh, DNA methylome changes. So that means essentially for every CBG site in our human genome and go through our uh, uh, whole embryonic development, we can know when it is fully methylated, when its methylation is removed, and when it is uh, come back again. So today I will not talk too much on this topic. And uh, several years ago, we also trying to develop a single cell uh, multi-omics sequencing technology can analyze both the DNA methylation and the quality accessibility simultaneously in the same individual cell. So we, because we know that the quality state or quality accessibility is also crucial to regulate the gene expression. And with this method, we analyze these human germline cells from the starting point, the gigot, uh, to the blastocyst states, our first week uh, development. And we see a lot of interesting things I will not cover the detail, but the key point is that we find a lot of interesting things is unique to our human species, but not exist in this mouse uh, model. So I think this is critical because per the, during the past 30 years, we always rely on this mouse model. 
So if it's some modern human conservative things, we already see it. But if it's some human unique ones, we never even know where they exist. So of course we, we will not know how evolution, if it is important and how it works. But now with this in hand, we can really uh, see these human unique features and uh, human human unique features. And uh, 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 then we will know our unique uh, biology. And then uh, start from about six years ago, we think uh, we need to do something uh, more uh, re clinical relevant. And in China, the cancer, in China, the cancer is a big problem uh, that uh, 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 that there are more than four, uh, nearly uh, five million people in China every year will got cancer, and nearly three million of them will die due to the cancer. So it's a very difficult, uh, challenging thing in China. And uh, we think probably through directly analyze human tumor uh, uh, samples in vivo, we will, uh, by single cell approach, we will get some new understanding of the cancer's uh, uh, molecular uh, features. And more importantly, <clears throat> we now know that we have the organoid culture system for this human cancer. And if combined with gene editing, and then go back again to the single cell sequencing, we will also see the causal effect to find the driving uh, molecular events in this cancer. And if we also do some drug screening, we even can uh, find maybe some uh, uh, drug candidate to treat uh, the cancer. So I think this will really be an exciting uh, chance. We want to uh, using our system to do something probably more helpful to the patients. And we know that cancer is very complex, much more heterogeneous than the uh, developmental uh, system. And because it contains both uh, cancer epithelial cells and microenvironment cells, and for the microenvironment cells, it also including the immune cells, the fibroblasts, and the endocellular cells. And for the immune cells, it also uh, have contains T cell, B cell, and many different types. So, so several years ago, when we started trying to working on this, we trying to uh, develop the single cell multi-omic sequencing technology, uh, can analyze both the transcriptome, the DMSome, and also the uh, genome copy number variation simultaneously. We call it the single cell uh, trio seq. So with this technology in hand, we collaborated with Professor Wei Fu's lab to analyze the human uh, Colorado cancer patient sample. So we choose a relatively uh, uh, late stage uh, tumors so we can get the primary tumor, the metastasis at the lymph node side or the, on the liver, or even some uh, recurrent uh, malignant, uh, recurrent uh, 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 tumors. <clears throat> and even for the same tumor, we're trying to separate different positions and then uh, keep this for this information and then do the single cell multi omics uh, sequencing. So we're using this uh, intro chromosome breakpoint to clearly separate these tumor cells into different clones in the same patient. And uh, here is one of the example from this patient. You can clearly see at the primary tumor uh, site, there's two major uh, clones, the clone A and the B. And they ha also have some further subclones. And very excitingly, we find that in fact, sorry, so can you see my, and uh, we, we can see that basically when they metastasize to the lymph node, it's only this uh, A clone just uh, do that. The B clone don't metastasize at all. And when they when you go to the liver uh, uh, metastasis site, it's also from the A clone. So that means it's really only the A clone just uh, uh, metastasized to these uh, uh, distal uh, organs. And uh, for this patient, uh, half a year later, they, the, there's a recurrent tumor also on the liver. So the, the, the patient received the second surgery and we analyze these tumor cells. And again, it's from this A clone, but not from B. And then the next question we want to ask is very straightforward. So how about the demethylation in these cancer cells? So do they change or not? So from this figure, you can clearly see the methylation is strongly decreased in these uh, tumor cells. So here is from one patient. So the first, the left column is from the uh, normal epithelial cells. And the right side is all from the tumors, but at different side. And you can see every individual cancer cells, the methylation is decreased 
And then uh, the second question we want to ask is how about the heterogeneity? And you can see even for the different cancer cells from the same patient, the methylation is very high heterogeneous. Although all of them are methylation decreased, but in some cells they only decrease 10%, but in other cells they decrease uh, up to 35%. So that's huge because we know that in one individual cell, there is 28 million CPT size. And if it's 35% methylation change, that means for more than 10 million CPT size, the methylation will go from the 100% to 0%. And then so how about the heterogeneity? Do they just uh, randomly distributed or just have some pattern? And we find that in, in general, the heterogeneity mainly happened more in these primary tumors. But for the metastasis side, the, um, the, the methylation variation is uh, relatively less. And then the next question is, for this heterogeneity of the demethylation between different uh, cancer cells in the same patient, so are they just between different genetic clones or even within the same clone? So here are some examples. So again, the left first column is from the normal epithelial cells, and these are different cancer clones. And you can say in general, in the same clone, different cells have similar methylation level, but between different clones, the methylation level can be quite different. So that means the heterogeneity of this demethylation in the same patient, but between different cancer cells, it tend to be happen between different uh, genetic clones, but in the same clone, they see they keep relatively similar methylation uh, levels. And the next question is uh, straightforward. So if uh, in the same clone, the, in the same site, the methylation is relatively similar, then during the metastasis, does the methylation change or not? So here are some examples. So again, the left column is the, from normal epithelial cells, and the right ones are from one genetic clone, but at different primary sites, uh, uh, different tumor sites in this patient. You, you can see from the primary tumor to the metastasis and lymph node or the liver or the recurrent one, basically the methylation don't change. So that means during the metastasis, so basically the demethylation don't change in the same uh, genetic clone. Uh, of course, this is at the global level. But if you're looking at individual genes, we know that in, in the genome, there's uh, uh, 20,000 uh, 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 20, genes, and still there can be several hundred genes that are promoter of CPT islands can uh, methylation increase or decrease, but the global level just uh, don't change too much. And the next question is, for these huge demethylation in the cancer cells, so it's quite just randomly distributed or it just have some specific features on the genomic region. So we compare our date to this previous uh, chip seek date, and then we find that in fact, the demethylation is not random in this cancer cell. It's strongly enriched on the hypochromatin region labeled as uh, H3K9 trimethylation, but depleted from the euchromatin region labeled as such as H3K4 trimethylation. So that means from the epigenetic uh, point of view, uh, the, the, the colorectal cancer, in fact, is a strong feature is a disorganization of their hydrochromatin uh, regions. The hydrochromatin region is very strongly demethylated and then probably make them uh, permissive to a lot of different abnormal expression uh, regulation. And then next question we want to ask is we're trying to analyze these very late stage uh, colorectal cancer. So how about that early stage before uh, the, the, they become malignant, uh, still at benign tumor stage, so how about the change? So we're trying to uh, uh, using another type of patients called FAP uh, patients. So these patients have a germline mutation of uh, APC gene, and APC is a tumor suppressor gene and also is a suppressor gene for the wind signaling of pathway. And we're trying to analyze several, these are the uh, family tree information of these patients and we first uh, sequence their uh, uh, cancer samples, uh, um, uh, exome, exomes. For these patients, so usually after 30 years old, there will be hundreds or even thousands of benign uh, tumors in their uh, 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 colon. And if you don't treat them properly, then many of them will soon become uh, a malignant uh, colorectal cancer. And in some patients, we get both the benign 
uh, tumor and also the malignant and the tumor. And uh, basic from these uh, renal specific exome sequencing, we can reconstruct the uh, genetic lineage tree of these tumor cells in the same patient. And very interestingly, you can see, firstly, people believe the metastasis is only after the malignant state. So the benign tumor, if these two separate tumor, they should have different uh, 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 origin, they should have different mutation. But what we see is that in some cases, in fact, even if it's physically separate benign tumor, they still sell many uh, point mutations. So that means they have the uh, same uh, um, uh, origin from the starting point. So we think this is uh, reasonable for the, co uh, for the uh, colon because we know that for the colon, the epithelium, there's a progenitor of the stem cells. And then probably at the stem cell stage, they accumulate some mutations and after the divide, they physically separate into different place and later be become a different uh, benign tumor. So that means it's not only after the malignant, malignant states, the tumor will become, uh, uh, can, can migrate. In fact, at the benign states, uh, at least for the colon, it can also physically uh, migrate and separate and become different uh, uh, benign tumors. And then the next question we want to ask is how about the gene expression in these uh, 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 epithelial cells? Because previously, people assume that if you have two copies of the tumor suppressor gene, for example, APC, if you only mute, mutate one of them, the cell in general should be fine. You already need to wait in the second allele mutated again, and then you have become the, the, the tumor gen genesis process happen. But surprisingly, we find that that's not the case because we find when we compare to the normal uh, the tumor adjacent tissues from other uh, sporadic uh, colorectal cancer patients, we find that these uh, so-called normal cells from these FAP patients, the epithelial cells, in fact, their gene expression is already dramatically changed compared to the other uh, sporadic colorectal cancer patients tumor adjacent normal tissue. And, uh, and in these cells, both the um, uh, metabolism and the cell cycle uh, changed a lot, so that means if you only lose one copy of this tumor suppressor in APC, essentially every of these um, uh, colon uh, epithelial cells already change their uh, identity. And we want to confirm this, so we do a, a immune staining of the KI67, and you can see from these uh, normal tissues from the sporadic colorectal cancer, it's quite, uh, the cell cycle uh, is not so active, but in these FAP patients, even these morphologically normal epithelial cells, most of them are in the active of uh, proliferating. And the next question we want to ask is, for example, we know the, the, the uh, 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 TCA cycles or the uh, TCA cycles is uh, decreased in the malignant tumor cells compared to the normal epithelial cells. And then how about that early benign states? So we analyze our data and we find that in fact, um, when you compare the normal uh, epithelial cells and the benign uh, tumors, the TCA cycle uh, or the metabolism, metabolism already strongly decreased. But from the benign states to the malignant states, it just uh, recover to some extent, but still lower than the normal epithelial cells. So that means the TCA cycles activity decrease is a very early event and later it just, it just alleviate, but still lower than the normal epithelial cells. And then the next question we want to ask is about the, the tumor microenvironment. So people purposely just assume all these genetic changes happened in the epithelial cells become tumor, and the surrounding, no matter immune cells or the uh, fibroblast or the endocytial cells, they just passively affected or induced by these tumor cells to do something bad, uh, but they are not genetically, they should be genetically normal. I think people, most people just assume that. And we think, well, maybe we need to recheck these things uh, because now we have the better technology. So we should really rigorously test if these micro, tumor microenvironment cells, do they really genetic normal or maybe some of them already abnormal? So we're trying to separate these uh, um, uh, epis, uh, uh, different type of these immune cells 
on the uh, uh, IP, uh, IP on the uh, fiber blood cells and also the um, endothelial cells, and then do the single cell uh, multi-omic sequencing to analyze both the transcriptome and the genome in the same individual cell. So we try to analyze 21 patients, and we we surprisingly we find in fact in many of these uh, immune cells there is already a nucleotide. Uh, that means one of their chromosomes already increase the copy number or decrease the copy number. And we think maybe we are very excited. To, we think maybe this is a, a cancer patient specific uh, phenomenon. So we do the control. So we choose six uh, normal person without uh, cancer. And uh, surprisingly, we find in fact for this normal person, their blood cell, their immune cells, it also contains several percentages of these nucleoid cells. And uh, when we looking at the percentage of these uh, uh, nucleoid immune cells, in fact, between the cancer patients and the normal person, the cancer-free person, there's no uh, statistically significant difference. And if we separate different type of the immune cells, such as T cells, B cells, or NK cells, you can always see in every type of these cells, no matter it's cancer patient or normal person, there is one to 15 or one to 20 percent of the cells are already unemployed. And the whole about the uh, fibroblast cells. And when we look at fibroblast cells, we also see uh, there's quite a percentage of them are unemployed ones. And more excitingly, we find the fact, if you're looking to a normal epithelial cell from the tumor adjacent tissues, uh, they have relatively low percentage, about uh, 1 to 11 percent of uh, these uh, fibroblast cells are undeployed. But if you're looking at these uh, fibroblast cells in the tumor tissues, it's much more uh, higher percentage, about the fourfold of higher, so around uh, one, uh, 10 to about even uh, 40. 47 percent. So that means in the, and more importantly, when we are looking uh, exactly which chromosome is affected, we, we are very happy to see that in fact, for these fibroblast cells in the tumor tissues, the, it already have some clonal expansion because you can clearly see in the normal uh, tissues, the fibroblast seems the uh, COVID number change, the chromosome is relatively random, but in these, uh, uh, tumor tissues, the fibroblast is mainly the chromosome seven copy number gain. And when we're also looking at the endocellular cells, we also see the phenomenon, but still can't see too much difference between the uh, normal tissue and the tumor tissue. And the, we're also looking at the transcriptome and find several markers. It's very nicely connected to the prognosis of these uh, tumor patients. And we confirm their specific expression in the fibroblast cells in these uh, uh, tumor samples, but not in the normal tissues. And we think these are really quite nice candidates for the prognosis of the colorectal cancer, or maybe even for other cancer, because the fibroblast is a common uh, component of many uh, different uh, tumors. So I think the, uh, the most exciting point is that, in fact, and also maybe sadly, we, every individual of us uh, we all are genetically mosaic at single cell level. So that means if you take some blood vessel cell, I believe that one to 15% of the cells will be unemployed. So, uh, so we think maybe they will connect with a lot of different diseases. So this is our simple idea. So we think probably uh, many life can do in this way and do some contribution to the cancer field. And finally, I want to thank um, many of my collaborators, especially Professor uh, Wei Fu, for the happy collaboration and thank all the students in my lab, uh, uh, all the work done by them. And uh, thanks to Wuji. Thanks, which whole very nice talk on single cell cancer genomics. Um, so let's see, any question from Slido? Um, so Xiang asked one question. Um, mm -hmm. I also, uh, you know, uh, copied it into the message uh, mm -hmm. box. So fascinating to see that methylation heterogeneity is greater in primary tumor. Is this because meds are younger or maybe selection pressure is greater in meds? Oh, I think this is mainly because in the primary tumor, there are more genetic clones. Uh, and we saw that the, the heterogeneity is mainly between different clones. 
And for the metastasis side, it's only usually just the less clone there, and then the hyperdeleted is, is usually is less. So Xi'an asked another question. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing results on CAF, uh, somatic variations. Uh, any ideas mm -hmm. of the functional consequences? Uh, yeah, I think this is a very great question. So, so I think uh, first, the, because we just assume that it's a cancer patient specific feature, for example, in these uh, immune cells, but but sadly we find it in fact is also in the normal person. And then we think in the other way. So probably these cells are already bad to to, to some extent. So maybe later when you have other um, many different uh, genetic related disease, if you have some uh, just have add some seed. Uh, uh, for example, if you have uh, uh, some, some, for example, the, the, the uh, uh, I think many uh, disease probably just uh, these bad cells, genetically bad cells will contribute uh, because it, it's already uh, in the say one cell, about 1,000 genes charging each person doses either increase 50% or decrease the 50%. So it must be these cells have some problem. And specifically for the fibroblast, we find that in fact the percentage in the tumor and the percentage in the normal tissue increase fourfold. So I think, and also the clone expansion. So I think definitely they should have some selection and must contribute to the tumor genesis uh, process. But we haven't had the direct evidence. I think hopefully Mandigo will join to together to see how this microenvironment genetically permanent change will promote the tumor genesis. So I think now we find the interaction between the epithelial and the non-epithelial cells. I think this is really a new idea for the uh, tumor study. Right. Then I have one question. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's amazing that you can uh, generate, you know, high quality um, DNA sequence data plus RNA seq data. Um, you know, from the DNA uh, mutations, you can group them into different clones. And mm -hmm. from RNA, uh, you can separate them into phenotypic different uh, groups. And how mm -hmm. would, you know, a genome mutation correspond to phenotype in your, in your data? Yeah, I think it's a very nice question, but uh, because we don't do a very large scale, so now the number of the cells with this uh, nucleotide is not so many. We only capture, I think, less than 1,000 in total, so we can still not see too much difference. But I think now uh, Professor Yan Yi Huang and uh, uh, Professor uh, um, uh, Bing Wang, they are doing uh, uh, another work and at a much larger scale and mainly in the healthy person. And I think they have a lot of exciting uh, 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 conclusions. So hopefully soon their paper will also be published. I think this is a really uh, exciting uh, field. Okay, thanks. Um, because of time, we have to stop here. Thanks and move okay, to thanks the a lot, Woody. Thanks. Uh, next speaker. So we will come back in a few seconds. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.